Um, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Adepoju, and I'm the ICRJ Community Manager for this uh, Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. And I'm welcoming you uh, to this webinar, and uh, which uh, is the latest in the series of topical issues that I've been discussing. Uh, conversations that have always been around uh, helping journalists to better cover uh, COVID-19 and other uh, health crisis on one hand, and to also, on the other hand, uh, we're also striving uh, to ensure that there is a better understanding of various aspects uh, of journalism and issues that are relevant uh, to journalists. And uh, our session today uh, is not uh, an uh, exception because uh, we were looking at a key issue that we believe uh, resonates well with uh, the media industry. And, uh, and this is the, the topic for today's dialogue uh, is on decoding audiences and creating uh, engagement uh, strategies. Uh, in the past, when uh, somebody says he or she is a journalist, uh, what the uh, task or responsibility of that person is uh, just gathering the stories and reporting the stories. Uh, but over the years, with the advent of new medium, new channels, new tools of, uh, for sharing uh, information, there is a better need to have a better understanding of who the audience is, what the audience in this is interested in, the format that uh, stories and content are expected to be structured and this would actually ensure that the goal of journalism, which is to inform the people, uh, and uh, is better achieved. And that is something we want to focus on today. And uh, we have a specialist uh, and an expert uh, with us today, uh, no other person than uh, Ricky Conrad, uh, who studies audiences as the director of science for Harmony Labs. And today's the dialogue, uh, uh, Ricky will be helping us to help our journalists and media entrepreneurs to better understand uh, what they can do to maximize engagement and deliver content that reaches uh, uh, those that really need the information. So I'd like to say good day, Ricky, and uh, good morning uh, to you uh, from Washington, DC. How are you doing today? Good morning. Thank you for having us. I am doing super. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Before we go to your presentation, I'd like to ask you uh, to give us a better understanding of what you do uh, at Harmony Lab so that our journalists can have a better understanding of who their uh, teacher is today. Harmony Labs is a 501c3 nonprofit in the United States. We use big data to help storytellers tell better stories. And we do that by combining data about audience, like who is spending their time where, online, on TV, and elsewhere, with information about the content that they consume. So we'll combine information about the URLs that are visited with the actual news stories that connect to those URLs so that we can do three things. One is that we can know how audiences are situated within a culture, a full culture, including news, as well as everything else that they consume. Two is so that we can track major narratives. We've been doing a lot of work right lately around economic mobility and watching how different narratives about how the economy works reach different audiences through the news as well as their entertainment, TV, TV news, music, and even social media. And then we sometimes work around story, which is a smaller unit. So narrative is big. And frequently we work with storytellers, mostly in the context of story to find hypotheses that we can test about how to bring stories to audiences that help them envision a better future, whether that means um, promoting an understanding of how, they, how the, we can solve climate change, how we can depolarize as a nation or solve any of our other major social issues. Uh, yeah, and I you. am the director of science, <laughs> sorry. Oh yes, oh yes, you are. And um, our audience are really excited uh, to learn from you today. So without much ado, I'd like you to go uh, to your presentation and uh, I'll be back with uh, the question and answer section. Are you ready? Yep. All right, okay. so today we're gonna talk Thank about you. audience. Okay. Yeah. Um, and audience is not narrative. We do a lot of narrative work, but today we're only gonna talk about audience. And I'm not necessarily gonna to try to compel anyone here to an understanding of audience or how audience works that they won't already feel really intuitive. But the one thing I really am gonna to hope to change is your perspective on whether an audience is a blob of people who share demographics or geography. There's a temptation to think of your audience either as some set of people that's been assigned to you by a comms department based on cross tabulations off a survey, or even just the people who happen by your site and like to consume your content. 
But we like to think of audiences as, you know, audiences, like whole audiences, people who share places they like to go, stuff they like to look at, and for whom a coincidence of demography and even geography is not necessary. And when you zoom out from audience as demographic or geographic blobs to the audience as a unit of people who go the same places and consume the same stuff, you get a different understanding of how audiences put stories together and encounter narratives in the world. I'm actually gonna start here with an example where I'm gonna walk through one whole audience. This is If You Say So in the United States. So you can see how this works. And then I'm gonna zoom out to the set of audiences that we tend to use as a framework for understanding how narratives get to people. So If You Say So is a really fun audience. They are very gaming first. I've just spent a bunch of time in their content. They love comedy. They love video games. They love hip hop. They tend to be younger, but the imagery here leads you to think, oh, all these people are under 25. That's because we have a, a stereotype that is inaccurate about who spends their time gaming. This audience is very slightly more likely to be men, but they're like 40% women. And when we step back from forcing those demographic distinctions, we learn a lot about what is true about the world rather than the, the audiences that we want to impose on it. This audience also does have a big spike of people under 24, but there are many, many people in this audience up to about the age of 50. When we use an audience lens to think about which news outlets are important or what counts as impact, it does change the landscape substantially. The metric that you're looking at here is unique views of content on a specific day. We almost always use reach as our metric for a variety of reasons. When we look at raw reach for a specific story that's super important, the, the specific set of platforms that matters to different audiences changes. The story that we analyzed here was one day of the news following the murder of George Floyd in the United States. This is June 1st of last year. The most impactful platform by raw count of people touched was Fox News. But those people aren't necessarily the most important audience to reach. When we look at If You Say So, who are substantially less likely to consume news in general, but because they're young, because they're diverse, because they're urban, are particularly important to reach with information about this story, the situation changes substantially. They are most likely to have gotten their news about the situation following George Floyd's murder from Yahoo, not from Fox News, or even any of the high uh, level mainstream sites like CNN. And one of the reasons that we think that happens, they consistently go to Yahoo when they seek news, is that Yahoo reporting tends to reflect the world they already live in. Remember, this is the audience that's really engaged with hip hop. And the imagery of the stories they were looking at there on Yahoo featured Black Americans protesting in the daylight with expressions of power. And that's in contrast to some of the other reporting that wouldn't have reflected on their worldview that featured nighttime riots and fires. So showing up and reaching an audience is partly about making sure that the content, it doesn't have to pander to them. They don't need you to just tell stories they're interested in, but the content needs to reflect on the worldview they have and resonate with their experiences in the rest of the culture. Part of that is showing up literally where they are. We say meeting audiences where they are a lot. That sounds a little bit like we just have to agree with them or give them what they want. In this case, it's a lot simpler than that. If you say so is by far the least likely to seek out and consume print news online. But they are among the top two audiences for contact with news on YouTube. And that's actually not because they watch a lot of news on YouTube. It's because they watch a lot of YouTube. The content that's really distinctive for this group of what they watch on YouTube reflects, an, again, this idea that you need to show up for an audience in a way and with voices that make sense to them. They watched a lot of content over the last three months that featured voices like Muriel Bowser, mayor of Washington, DC, who wrote Black Lives Matter on one of our major thoroughfares, and Dave Chappelle, uh, a black comedian in the United States whose edgy look and feel 
is really consistent with how if you say so wants to encounter the world. So this is if you say so, right? There, all the other stuff I just showed you is super US specific, but there's a trick to how we organize audiences that makes the insights around organizing audiences audience cross borders. And it is that if you say so is one of four audiences who has a value called autonomy, which exists in every culture in the United States. There are, sorry, in the world. There is an if you say so everywhere in the world. These four values, community, autonomy, social order, and authority are cross-cultural. They've been measured for many years. They were developed by um, a social psychologist named Shalom Schwartz, and they've been measured many year, for many years in the World Values Survey. The if you say so audience that exists elsewhere actually surprisingly has a lot of the same cultural touch points as here in the United States. Hip hop tends to be big in lots of places. Elon Musk as a person is a really good touch point for this audience internationally. But even where the specific people and expressions change, that core value of autonomy, which is related to hedonism, enjoyment, entertainment, sex, having a good time and substances, as well as creativity, self-direction, and, uh, oh, I said entertainment already. That set of values is a blob that exists everywhere. So I wanna walk you through what these four audiences look like in the United States. And they are going to look a little bit like audiences you're gonna see elsewhere, because again, these are value-based audiences. Now, the way to think about a value is it's a goal. And they're not highfalutin goals like patriotism or purity. They're simple, basic human needs. People power's goal is community. A goal is the, the story need that you fulfill with the stories you select across the culture in your life. And for people power, this is the United States progressive base, the idea that collectives come together to solve social issues shows up again and again. They celebrate diversity, um, which is very different from some other audiences. They're very politically active and they're very engaged in the service of racial and gender justice. If you say so, also votes progressive, but they are not, they don't believe fundamentally in the power of the collective. Instead, if you say so is skeptical. They're skeptical of parties. They're skeptical of platforms. They wanna think for themselves and they like the edgier voices like Dave Chappelle. They are, however, really active for racial justice. Tough cookies are my favorite audience. They exist everywhere, and they exist everywhere in a really loud way right now. For tough cookies, the most important core value is social order, preserving the social order. A tough cookie likes there to be a set of rules that's very predictable that they can follow. They tend to be engaged with politics. They're highly engaged with the news. They're twice as likely to consume online news in a given day as, any, as the if you say so audience. But one of the challenges associated with this audience is that social order orientation makes them authoritarian. And so they tend to be seeking a sense of what Karen Stenner, a social psychologist from Australia, would call oneness and sameness. They like police procedurals. They like cozy feelings when they're at home. And for them, the world outside their home is a dangerous place and they are constantly seeking leadership. Interestingly, in the United States and elsewhere, authoritarians are not reliably conservative. They tend to seek leadership, strong feeling leadership from both sides. And in the United States, the tough cookies are one third Democrat, one third Republican, and one third self-identified independent. They spend a lot of time consuming their news on all the different platforms available to them. So they consume Fox News, they consume fake news from QAnon and Epic Times, and they consume uh, mainstream news as well as left-leaning news from outlets like Washington Post. The challenge with the tough cookies, and I bet this is true internationally, although I haven't checked, is that they're constantly seeking information so that they can establish a sense of what the rules are they can follow. But in a situation like we're often facing in the United States right now, where there's polarization and disagreement, they go back and forth from these different places and, and end up in a kind of what my friends who do qualitative research call a despair spiral. 
because they can't sort out what the truth is. And one of the challenges we face with tough cookies is that they can often turn to places like YouTube where analysts offer to explain it to them. Um, and then it stops being news. So tough cookies have this great potential, but they are a particular audience of interest now. It's also the case that the tough cookies audience grows. And this is, this is true everywhere because of the way our psychology works when the conditions encourage fear and anger. So COVID has increased the number of tough cookies in the United States. At the beginning of last year, we did the original research around this. It was like 20%. And then by the end of the summer, like 50% of people were leaning tough cookie. The interesting thing about that transition is that when your fear starts to be activated, and I experienced this myself, you actually do start changing the stories you seek out in the culture. So when COVID hit and we were trying to juggle babies being home and having full-time jobs, I stopped being able to watch anything on TV except the Great British Bake Off. And I think that's a really good example of what it means to seek social order from your media. The final audience is Don't Tread On Me. And this is a really interesting audience. These folks are consuming almost exclusively very conservative news. So where we talk about the bubble, this is the audience that's in a bubble. Uh, they also cons consume a lot of uh, really marginal news sites. LifeSite News comes up here, places that, that traffic and conspiracy. For Don't Tread On Me, the core value is authority. And the distinguishing between a tough cookie and a Don't Tread On Me is really important. A don't Tread On Me has what we call a social dominance orientation or a preference to accumulate power for themselves. So in addition to wanting there to be rules, they want to follow, they want the rules to be made by them. They want to be in charge. Whereas a tough cookie wants someone to be in charge. That's really important when we talk to them and about how they frame the world. Don't Tread On Me tend to seek out stories outside the news that feature very strong men, often leading families, uh, you think maybe that this is a group that consumes, or maybe if you have a lot of stereotypes about how it works here, you would think that this was a, a deep evangelical group. Evangelicals definitely occupy this group, but so does hard rock. This is a group that will watch a lot of Metallica videos on YouTube. Uh, and depending on how close the group members are to the if you say so crowd, they're going to engage in a lot of first person shooter games and otherwise engage with a culture that's very much about dominance. So again, this idea of organizing our audience is not in terms of their demography, but in terms of the stories that they seek out, the way they see the world and their core values helps us understand how stories can land with them, where they're gonna to wanna to spend time and what stories need to get to them and how we can bring them there. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. And then Paul, maybe you and I can just chat. Yeah, so, uh, so thank you very much uh, for setting the, uh, the table for the conversation. And um, talking from a journalist perspective, uh, why do you think um, a journalist or a media entrepreneur has to be really, really worried uh, about uh, the issue of audience engagement? Uh, since on one side, and it's, it's expected to be an individual's responsibility uh, to actively seek out the right information. So when did uh, the responsibility, when does it switch uh, to the journalists or the media organization? That is such a good question. So I wanna think about it for just a second. Um, I think I'm not a journalist, so I think you're all doing your jobs great. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really hard job. But I think where we face as a society some real risks is that we have audiences that think they are fulfilling that individual responsibility to seek out the information. And the information is not there where they are. Um, and they don't necessarily have good signals about what the best information, the true information or the real information is. The biggest example of that is Tough Cookies who are actively reading literally everything, everything they can get their hands on. And all my, my colleagues who do research in that group are finding that they are more and more despairing. I think there is a, there's a narrative that there's news avoidance. There, that is not the case for Tough Cookies but there is not a lot of satisfaction in the information received. And so being able to show up where they are, to show up with stories that resonate with the rest of their cultural experience, which doesn't mean pandering, it doesn't mean lying, and it doesn't mean only doing kitty videos as we were discussing before the talk today. It means having that look and feel that's like, no, I get you. Like, 
I too have eaten cookie salad if you're from the Midwest. Uh, and here is how this story affects you in a way that you can trust. That feels really important. The other truth is that if you say so is also not a bunch of numpties. They're not seeking out print news, but they are going to Twitter where they must be getting news. They're seeking out ESPN where they get some kinds of news. They're not ignoring social issues, but the way they live their life is, does not necessarily afford sitting down and reading long form print articles. So I think showing up in those places, assuming that the people will want to consume your content is an easier play than standing back and waiting for them to show up in the form and format that you are presenting. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, can we stop sharing your screen? Uh, so that we yep, can... absolutely, so you can see my face. Okay, yeah, very good. And um, so before I ask the next question, I would like to uh, inform everyone on this call that uh, if you are joining us with, uh, via the Zoom platform, uh, you can use the Q&A function uh, to submit your questions. I've, I'm already seeing some questions already. So if you really have a bunny issue uh, that you want uh, our experts to uh, help you about, uh, you have the chance to drop it in form of a question. And if you are joining us via the Facebook live stream, uh, you can also use uh, the comment section under this live stream uh, to also put in your questions. And um, on the issue of the audience engagement, and uh, I'm really happy that you mentioned uh, something that I think uh, is also a major concern to many journalists and media organizations, which is uh, this uh, issue of bubbles in which uh, only a particular set of information gets to a particular type, type of audience. Uh, for instance, uh, let uh, individuals that are pro-left wing uh, in the US would always be seeing content from left wing linked personalities and media organizations. And the same thing also happens on the other side. But journalism is expected to be fair, is expected to be balanced, is expected to uh, provide news for everybody. So uh, for a media organization or a journalist or a media entrepreneur that is really passionate and concerned about reaching everybody on, the, on all the sides of the aisle. So what do you think a reliable, smart, and efficient approach towards en actively engaging all the audiences on all spectrums would be? So I think, and I recommend this to all the storytellers that I have is having an audience is a worthwhile strategy goal because hoping that you will reach everyone, especially given the wide variety of cultural preferences we have above and beyond our political positions is really hard. Like you aren't gonna be a successful YouTube strategy at the same time that you have a super successful long form print strategy. That's actually, that's different expertise. And it's okay to just be like, I'm serving this audience. So it's fine to let out some audience, but it is possible to present news that is attractive to a wide variety of people. And I think when we think about the people who need the information, maybe especially to the if you say so's and tough cookies, and then how do we depolarize? So some of this is not research we have done. There is new research from More in Common covered in the Atlantic last week that suggests that being local helps because there are lots of different reasons why that would be true. But featuring a local news source can establish a shared in-group with your audience, which helps to mitigate the distrust that you get from both Tough Cookies and Don't Tread on Me. So being local and having a local strategy, and there are lots of ways that's being done by major national news outlets and, and funders, um, is a really good starting point, I think. Yeah. At least it's a really promising starting point. Uh, the other thing to think about is whether you can offer solutions journalism. I'm seeing in the chat a question from Steve. We actually don't know exactly how and how well solutions journalism works, but we know for sure that it's going to be easier for people to click like on, on both sides of the aisle. So having a, a universal strategy. The other thing worth saying about this is that in data science, when we build machine learning or artificial intelligence models, those models can be biased unintentionally. And so the emerging um, standard in data science is simply transparency. And I think being transparent about who you are and where your funding comes from and what your, your vibe is, is actually one way to acquire and maintain public trust. The, one of the few um, sources that is trusted by Republicans outside of Fox News is PBS, for instance. 
because their their vibe, their intention, and their sources of funding are very transparent. Oh yes. Um, do you think the type of news uh, that a media platform shares uh, has more impact on audience engagement, or uh, the strategy? or the structure or the channels through which uh, this content is being shared. So what are the major factors that you think drives audience engagement? Effective content is a, a more effective than audience strategy. So if you have really good engaging content, that is actually gonna always be better and more important than having a really strong audience strategy. Um, although there are types of news that are really particularly appealing to certain audiences. So if you really want to reach a specific segment of the United States, you need to offer at least some celebrity gossip. And you don't have to, I'm not recommending that everybody rush out and have a celebrity gossip play, but Vice, for instance, is a brand that already has a really strong brand in that and is able to build quite a strong parallel news brand. So I think that content definitely matters. Having really strong content matters more than audience, but you don't have to pander. You can just be who you are. Well, there are many media outlets that have been who they are. And uh, sometimes as a journalist, you expect that I've put a lot of effort into this content. And uh, in this age of uh, digital uh, media, where there are metrics that are attached to every story, uh, a story that was well written but does not uh, resonate well uh, with the audience, may not get the number of clicks, and uh, it may actually weigh down on the journalists and may actually be used as a key metric uh, to access uh, a particular journalist. So what do you think uh, can actually be done to ensure that, uh, even from the part of the journalist, uh, to ensure that uh, this story, uh, the goal is for pe more people to be aware of it, actually the right people to be able to achieve uh, the desired change. Uh, you can approach this, uh, this question from the angle of what people are doing wrong uh, in terms of uh, content strategy so that they can take a note and improve on them. Um, I'm going to weigh in as a measurement specialist. All of the measurement is wrong. There's nothing wrong with the reporting, although probably there's reporting that could connect with an audience and there's probably reporting that could like be a little bit more down home and use language that works better. But the real fundamental problem there, again, to this comment from Steve, is that you're measuring the thing that you don't want to incentivize and then you're incentivizing the wrong thing. Here's how this works. In measurement, the thing that you measure has some driving force behind it. Here, we're measuring likes and clicks. The driving force behind likes and clicks is two things. One is either liking the content, which is hard to do with some of the news we need to consume. A lot of the news that I need to have in my house about whether COVID is rising or falling, I don't like any of that. So that's a terrible thing to measure. Now let's talk about what clicks do. A click is an instant response, something that a human does because they had a, a little flash go off back here. Psychologically, those flashes are caused more often by anger and fear than by positivity, joy, hope, or humor. That is because just fundamentally in your back brain, negativity is more accessible. So incentivizing likes and clicks incentivizes fluff stuff that doesn't say anything. And we were just talking about this before that on Yelp, all the beer breweries have five stars. Of course they do, they serve beer. So it's not helpful to say, oh, you should only publish kitty stories because you can't do that. And it's not helpful to incentivize by clicks because those will necessarily drive the work to be more polarizing, more focused on anger, more focused on fear. So find a better way to measure the thing. Is there a better way to measure the thing? Actually, yes. Is it really, really, really hard and expensive to do? Absolutely. So, so I think the measurements- the so what do you think will be a, a more fair, a fairer approach uh, for measurements? The fastest and sort of most practical approach to improving the measures we have is to set better benchmarks. So if you were stuck with only ever having clicks forever, and I'm not comfortable asserting that that is the case, then we would want to set a custom benchmark for each article or piece 
based on other articles and pieces intended to convey similar information so that you were comparing against a fair benchmark. It's not fair to compare my article about COVID to somebody's article about this cute dog with funny teeth. Like that's just a, that's a bad comparison. And so in science, we always are looking for what the control is. And that kind of work can be done. It is actually really statistically hard. And I've had a lot of conversations with journalists. And this is true, by the way, for all kinds of creators who are asked essentially to evaluate their own work with no background in statistics, the kind of statistics I'm talking about takes some very, very advanced graduate level training. So it can be done, but it's really hard. Now, um, another question that I'd like to ask is this, uh, at what point do you think uh, a media organization needs to rethink uh, its audience engagement uh, strategies? And um, a, a, a second part of the question that I also have for you is, uh, uh, we've agreed that uh, focusing on likes and clicks uh, are not really good metrics, uh, but uh, there is a reason why they continue to be uh, what the standard currently is. So um, what do you think are the obvious signs that we are not measuring the right thing? And are they having any impact on day-to-day -day lives of people that are consuming this content? Um. Not sure it's obvious, but the constant and increasing polarization and the signs that in the US, especially the news is being driven toward unnecessary negativity, uh, I think are good signs that we need a different strategy for incentivizing. I don't know that there's any individual brand that is uh, in, a, in a, a tough place here. The difficulty that we face is that we often want our evaluation to be cheap. Unfortunately here, we don't have a good enough measure of the thing that we want. Um, I've heard somebody from the New York Times once said we should be optimizing for trust, which is a thing I really like. It's not entirely true because there are plenty of news brands out there that are um, selling conspiracies and are widely <laughs> trusted, but it is close. We should be optimizing for an audience having received the information, actively seeking the information. And the other thing to watch out for is if you don't know whether or not you are reaching distinct people, uh, then you should have an understanding of whether that's happening. Some of that's doable. At Harmony, we carry a lot of data from a variety of places that are the demand side that tell us which audience members are looking at what. But most news outlets have a, available to them something from the supply side. Simply, I have presented this and this many observations have occurred, which gives you little information about whether that's reaching diverse people Sometimes you know whether they're distinct people, but you don't know whether or not it's all just people who are already converted and already well-informed and are just really deep into that topic. And so if I were building an audience strategy, I would be building a measurement strategy for understanding who the audience is and how diverse that audience is. And, and I would be optimizing for new users over time so that you were growing your brand. It's, it's yes. uh, the data problem is hard. It's really hard. Yeah, there is also an issue, an issue that I think I would like you to focus on and give uh, suggestions or tips on. Uh, every journalist, uh, every content producer desires uh, the viral factor that um, my content will reach as many people as possible uh, in different geographical areas. And um, do you think is a, that is a really good goal? And if it's how do you think um, it can impact uh, how journalism is practiced? And what do you think are the quickest ways to ensure that uh, a very good content reaches as many journalists, uh, sorry, reaches as many uh, audiences as possible? That's a really good question. So I will say that I think virality or going viral, having an exponential curve of distribution is something that scientists still cannot predict from content. So despite that we know that kitties are going to be more popular than articles about how drinking probably kills you, we can't tell which kitties are going to be a hundred times more effective than the other kitties. But having as a goal, really wide distribution is a good idea because it means that you have effectively understood what the audience who doesn't already know your information is like. The main challenge we face is that we write stories that resonate with us because we're right here in the chair. And those stories don't necessarily contain themes or ideas that resonate with some exterior audience. 
Uh, so I do a lot of work directly with artists, for instance, who are very different from journalists and have very different constraints. But one of the things that really helps them is actually putting an audience, like if you say so, in their head when they're creating and thinking, just trying to reach toward a specific audience, differentiating the uninformed audience into people who are informed about plenty of stuff, just not your stuff, can really, really help. And picking one such audience can really help to make the content start to seed in the spaces that make virality possible, but definitely make reach outside the base uh, likely. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that was uh, that was really really good. So, are we saying that um, uh, only videos or content of cats uh, will always be more popular than um, many serious issues uh, that the world deals with? And if this is so, what do you think the kinds of content that more people consume, uh, what do you think that says about who we are? Or uh, this is not, or uh, does it have absolutely nothing to do uh, with individuals' personality, with the audience's personality? That's a good question. Core values do drive whether or not you actively seek out content that is more serious in nature, although that doesn't make you a better person. I think that sometimes because that's a value for us, we just assume that's what makes you a good person. But sometimes it makes you a person who can't tell a joke. One of the ways to think about audience is that they are they're swimming in a giant sea of the culture. And for every single audience, news is a tiny fraction of what they consume, a tiny fraction. Um, so the other stuff that they're consuming is they're listening to Spotify all day and they're watching some videos on YouTube or they are reading a book. And so news is going to be a small proportion for every single person who is consuming news with a couple of exceptions. You have people who have Fox News on in the background all day. Uh, so I think you can think about what you do in news as not needing to compete with the kiddie of videos. Like it's not, that's, that's not your benchmark. Your benchmark is, did I get the information to the people who needed the information in order to live their lives? Things are changing and they're new. And that is my job to get that information out there. Entertainment is not necessarily the goal of the news. I think that the click through as a metric is driving us to believe that entertainment is the goal. One thing you can do, though, to get more of that traffic and get that traffic to be persistent is make sure that you tell complete stories so that people like the solutions model has a psychological effect, which is that if you give people that little view of the future at the end, that that will let them be on board with your news and your news style for longer rather than activating them once and making them shut down because you made them really angry or afraid. Okay, um, there is one other issue that um, I always think about when I'm thought uh, when I'm looking at how do media organizations are able to attract as much audience to them, uh, to their content as possible. And um, it's also the issue of uh, survivor of uh, those media establishments. For instance, uh, men, there are numerous news outlets online and um, because of the dwindling fortune of a print press, uh, there is an attention to look at the online platforms uh, for monetization. And uh, monetization in a, a major way of monetization is putting up paywalls. And uh, for instance, there are several popular news at, uh, outlets, uh, some of which you've mentioned today in your presentation, that also have uh, paywalls up. And um, how do you think uh, media uh, journalists, uh, how do you think we can ensure that paywalls do not get in the way of maximized audience engagement? That's not possible. <laughs> so here's the thing is I am not an expert on the economy of news. This is a major issue. It's become increasingly an issue. Um, I do have friends who are working in this space, including Eli Pariser, uh, who is running an organization right now. And he talks a lot about the idea that we would want to have a part of the internet that works like a library and news should be in there. Uh, one of the challenges we face with paywalls is not only do they limit your audience to the people who already know they're interested in your stuff. There's like a technical solution to that, right? Give people a bunch of free articles, just like Slate does. But they also just means test access to the information. And we know, it, and one of the challenges we have is that the audiences with less money actually also, if you say so, for instance, tends not to be interested in news. Uh, I think there are 
There are creative things that are being done all over the space to help solve this. Widely available podcasts, which are in a format that's different from that print news, but can lead you back to engage with the paywall. Like I think that all the experiments that are out there are worth it and everybody's struggling with how to fix this model. Ultimately, my guess is that we will need to have to offer some kind of public option. <laughs> <laughs> there had to be a more robust public investment in an information ecosystem that creates an intellectually um, agile electorate, because otherwise we're going to be in trouble. Yeah. So even though the print press uh, is uh, is still struggling in most parts of the world, uh, do you think there is any audience engagement strategy that journalists that are working in this uh, sector can actually adopt or adapt to improve? Uh, to ensure followership and uh, they are better, they can better serve uh, their news content consumers. The stuff I see that's really exciting is the stuff that's starting to use more graphic content, um, graphic novel style content, memes. So memes do have some psychological downsides. They can make things seem simple that are not simple and part of the role of, of a really good news brand is to help make complicated things understandable but not trivial. But the idea of using some visual material to make content more accessible, I don't know as much about international work, but here in the United States, there are audiences that engage almost exclusively with imagery-based media. That's not just the YouTube phenomenon where I have friends who lament that their, their kids would rather watch a video about how to do something than read the instructions. I, but it is just a phenomenon that's gonna be a worldwide phenomenon. There are audiences that are simply going to want to see the stuff visually. And so bringing it to them visually is really a valuable way to start. Oh, yes. Uh, so we have this uh, question, I think uh, a really good one from Stan Tomzak. Uh, who is, uh, let me read Stan's uh, question. A lot, if not the majority of the content the news outlets share on social media is not good news. Uh, how do you encourage people to like that content, content like disasters, social problems, climate crisis, uh, content that, are in, uh, that is intuitively unlikable. Uh, if people don't like that content, uh, social media platforms, algorithms think is news that is not worth spreading. I think, uh, so this is an interface between uh, bad news, uh, which uh, social media algorithms think are not worth uh, spreading. So how do you think we can deal with this uh, issue? So I think continuing to hold the major platforms accountable for their algorithms is important. Um, I think there have been substantial changes in how the algorithms work over time, especially on places like YouTube. Uh, they've been pretty transparent that they have altered their algorithms to lead you less swiftly to the conspiracy theory stuff. So that's all good. I think that hoping for likes isn't great. One thing that is true though on Facebook in particular is that the algorithm actually prefers anger and fear responses. I've spent a lot of time trying to get content that is good stories out to, to function on Facebook. Uh, and so sometimes you don't have this problem on Facebook, but what can you do on the supply side? What can you do if you are a journalist who's like wanting to put content out there that people will actually like take their medicine? Like you, you gotta know there is a genocide in country X. Uh, and I think, again, I keep coming back to the potential of a solutions model. The thing that if you're not an interested audience, you have basically two options of getting that audience on board. One, you can connect it directly to the, to the personal interests of that audience in the United States right now. If you say so, is going to consume a lot of content that concerns racial justice. That's an issue that affects them as young people of color. Um, and so actually, one of the things I have seen is that the immigration content that they consume, for instance, tends to have themes associated with Black America. They are interested in Kamala Harris's background because she is half Black and half immigrant. They are interested in African diaspora experiences. So is there a way that you can actually make it feel relevant and personal? That's that idea of bridging between you and the audience is when we talk about all the time. And then the other one is to offer um, a full story. This is the power of journalism. Journalism is not tweets, lucky you. Like you can tell a whole story with a past and a present and a future. And that power is unparalleled in our society. And offering that vision of a future is something that can get people to actually click through and read the content. I, I feel like this is especially true on climate. I want somebody to help me 
run some studies on this, but right now climate is just starting to do solutions-based messaging. And I feel like people are going to share that on, on like, you guys, we could do this wind farm thing. Let's try this wind farm thing. That's more shareable and more clickable than something that's like, yeah, still on fire. Yeah, talking of uh, stuff that are likable and clickable, um, I've always had this concern within me. And I think uh, some uh, several weeks ago, uh, we had representatives, uh, somebody from the WHO and uh, other outlets that are working towards uh, taking on misinformation. And um, when we talk about misinformation, uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I know you are aware of what happened during the uh, call for people to uh, the chloroquine, uh, chloroquine uh, uh, popularization. And uh, so my question is this, why do you think uh, fake news and misinformation, why do they, why do they seem to attract more uh, audience than actual news? And is there any strategy that those that are propagating fake news are using that real journalists and those that are sharing factual information can actually tap in to ensure that they are able to reach more people and not struggle to get the right and accurate information out there? I love this question, Paul, because I just finished an initial exploration of this issue. We did not coordinate this ahead of time. So I can't promise that any of this is, it, the quant here is perfect, but here are some really important observations. One, fake news is actually a lot less common than mainstream news um, consumption. In the United States, for instance, we're looking at, like on YouTube, something like a max of 10 out of a thousand people who use YouTube on a day are gonna consume something from one of the major peddlers of fake news. Like a lot of people watch Fox News, a lot. So comparatively, when we think about the scale of the problem, very right-wing mainstream news is actually potentially a bigger problem. One of the reasons that that feels like it's not true, I think is actually a journalistic echo chamber Fake news and Q and conspiracies is pretty sexy. So we want to talk about it. We want to cover it. Whereas we've kind of already talked about how there are biased mainstream news outlets and there isn't a whole lot new to say about that. But it, the problem, while small, does have a very specific flavor. First of all, in that values map that I showed you, fake news has a specific home. It comes from Don't Tread on Me. The main consumers of QAnon, Epic Times, and PragerU, which are the three that I tend to follow because they're really big, are down there in the Don't Tread on Me space. But they're very close to the line next to Tough Cookies, and they attract a lot of Tough Cookies. That's because conspiracies make, first of all, they're really cool and they have a lot of cult-like story elements, um, but they make you feel like you're in control. And establishing a sense of control is a really important part of meeting the, the core story needs or values for those groups. Social order, a sense that there's a set of rules that you can follow to stay safe. And authority, or a sense that you can gain power or control over your situation. So it would be always true that fake news and conspiracy come out of there. And one of the reasons psychologically that they might be surging right now is just that we all feel out of control in the United States. Two reasons. One, of course, is COVID. It's getting better here, but for the last year, we've all been afraid literally every second of every day. And the other is the uncertainty around the American election that just drove a lot of people to, to get into this very difficult psychological space. So we know that's where it comes from, but that does not mean that other people are immune to it. There's plenty of crazy conspiracy stuff that happens on the extreme left, like stuff about fluoride, stuff about, especially the COVID vaccine stuff is very universal. Um, but one of the things I would I, I have noticed about those conspiracy sites is actually the, the thing they do that we don't necessarily do with conventional news brands is they throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall. So a core conspiracy site, um, Life Site News, which has as its stated goal anti-abortion um, news, we'll put that in quotes because it's not very newsy, um, but really has a lot of content all over the site that is intended to draw people in on other topics. So they have a lot of COVID conspiracy stuff. They have Catholic conspiracy stuff. The intention is to, is to provide as many possible on-ramps as possible into the conspiracy ecosystem so that you bring people in and start teaching them this new set of rules, which is a little bit different from how conventional news works and is definitely different from how conventional advocacy works. 
Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for taking on that question. And um, I think uh, the conversation is on ending. And I would still like to tell our audience that if you still have one or two questions, I can still take one or two questions uh, before uh, we call it today. And um, talking about uh, this issue of um, audience engagement and uh, the dilemma, because there, a, there is a lot uh, of issues that are dotted around being able to actively engage the audience and being able to actually succeed at it. Uh, we, well, there are several news platforms that I do follow and um, uh, what some of them that have been able to transition from just being successful uh, print outlets is also the quality of their web platforms. Uh, for instance, uh, I remember when um, the Washington Post and the New York Times did stories uh, to uh, to depict the importance, the, the 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 magnitude, the size of a pandemic, of the impact of the pandemic, in which they actually use the picture to denote each person that died uh, during the pandemic. That actually resonated very well around uh, the globe, not just across the US alone. Another issue that I also want to bring about is uh, uh, the visualization and the tools that these media outlets are able to actually roll out. And uh, when you talk to uh, a local news outlet, they tell you that these stuff are very, very expensive and uh, they are not a large teams are always around uh, putting a uh, put into this uh, this content and these uh, productions together. Uh, for what do you think is a cheap approach towards expanding a media outlets uh, engagement strategies uh, so that they can actually survive the test of time by still being able to attract and maintain that loyal users of good news. Oh, cheap. That's hard. So the reason that those data visualizations that outlets like New York Times, they just published a great one yesterday. Those are crazily expensive to make and they can't be less expensive to make because, because they are custom art and art is expensive. This is a thing I only learned in, in my late middle age. But um, what you can try to do is maintain a YouTube presence. So we talk a lot about where people spend their time. Like if you want to engage an audience, it's good to show up where they are. And there's so many options now. You could be on TikTok, you can be here, you can be there. It turns out that reliably, your top two places to show up are Google and Facebook products. So that includes both Insta and Facebook. If you choose to narrow your aperture just to those and get good at one or both of those, that's your best option. That doesn't make it cheap because good video is expensive. The problem with artists is they're so expensive and they're so necessary. <laughs> but you can at least say for now, we don't need a TikTok strategy. We don't need a strategy for every one of these. We just need to get really good at being on the major platforms and making sure we have organic reach through networking with other partners and, and maintaining uh, our reach through a shared body of audience. So you have your own audience, perhaps you have other partners who reliably will link to your content on that YouTube platform. But the ones that you can reliably say, I only need to be here are Facebook and YouTube, but also if you're doing paid pr promotion, um, Google search is a place that people spend an awful lot of their time as well. I also have a question for you on uh, maximizing audience engagement um, in parts of the world where um, there is limited or restricted access to free information. Uh, it suppressed uh, democracies where the government controls everything that the people, uh, almost everything that the people can actually access. So um, for media organizations there, uh, their reach is highly limited because they are also are restricted. Uh, do you have any suggestions and recommendations for them? I have almost no, no knowledge of this. All I have is rumors from my friends who work do more international work than I do. Their strategies are very WhatsApp based, um, but it is it's super super challenging, and the landscape there is completely different than even places that have somewhat restricted but available platform access. Now, from the data that you've had access with, from the, from the data points that you're tracking, uh, do you have any idea of how the pandemic has influenced audience engagement? Has it been a good 
impact or um, it's really, really uh, a negative impact? That's a really good question. So I know that it rose like a lot. People were sitting around in their houses during March and April of last year and just consuming a lot of stuff. I don't know that we can say what the net positive or negative impact is. I think we're going to see this year as things settle out, which of those habits that people established are going to uh, sustain. So a lot of what happened last year was really negative. People got into these terrible spirals um, of going back and forth with conspiracies. But at the same time, many of them started to consume more news, started to really tune in. So I think what we want to do is wait a year and see where we are after a natural psychological recovery takes place and we all are able to calm down. And that's here in the United States. I am fully aware that that, that year-long recovery is starting here now in a way it's not elsewhere. Of course. Now, um, as a wrap-up, I would like you to look at what the future of audience engagement would be. Uh, are there some Pandora boxes that we are yet to open? And um, how do you ensure that these uh, are also very fair and uh, everybody is able to actually maximize uh, the tricks uh, towards uh, achieving best audience engagement? I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, like, it's very hard to tell where things are going and how to future proof. One of the things I think is really valuable though, is that those core audience values are never gonna change. Those are, those are always gonna be built into the back of your brain. You're always gonna have those four audiences. And the dominance of the current ways of consuming things is actually gonna change more slowly than we think it is. And so it's not necessary to go herring off after every new platform. Um, I know that it can become really overwhelming and it's really important that we do more, that we evolve, that we meet people where they are, but you wanna be strategic. I think the best way to plan for the future of any organization is to have a really, really clear audience strategy. Like know exactly who you want to to be targeting and try to move them where they are and pay some attention to where they are and make sure some of the other doors are just closed. <laughs> it's very hard right now because you feel like you need to be everywhere moving everyone, but maybe it's okay to just make your mission. Like I'm, we're tough cookies. We're here to make tough cookies better informed and more confident in the news or whatever it is. Everybody has a different approach. Um, but I, I think only a handful of outlets in the United States have the power to reach and move everyone. So what do you think will be the next focus for Amuni Labs, uh, especially focusing on this issue that we are discussing today? So I have a few different things that I am interested in pursuing and we've talked to partners about. It feels like the power of solutions journalism is the potential there is tremendous. And so I'm quite interested in learning more about not only whether it works, but exactly how it works and how we can do solutions journalism and find examples of existing solutions journalism that have coding or language that feels different than what we've seen in examples of solutions journalism today. What kind of solutions journalism shows up in evangelical and Christian uh, outlets, for instance, which is going to have a different look and feel, but how could we create a generalizable understanding of who's receiving solutions journalism and how that's moving them? That's one big thing. And the other thing that's come up just in the last week is the power and potential of local news. Um, and the, and uh, partly this is because there, there's, there's a little bit of renewed interest in creating and maintaining a robust local news structure. And I'm really interested in helping organizations that wanna find ways to make local news efficiently, especially because as you said, data and visualization are very, very expensive. And so maximizing those resources is something that we can help with. Yeah, we have some last minute questions that are popping up. I think uh, we should take them. Uh, Edna from uh, Philippines would like to know whether there are tools that are available to identify who these value-based audiences are, especially for those that want to develop that strategy. Um, that is a really good question. The available data depend on the country that you live in, but I can give you an, uh, um, one second, I'm gonna pop this link in there. This is a publicly available, um, website with profiles and an audience classifier. If you do survey work, you can use a similar audience classifier to put people into the different buckets. In order to understand how these different values groups fall out in your country, um, a data scientist can analyze the world values survey for you. There are Philippines data for you there. 
And you can also start to use these values in your audience research, the ongoing survey work you do in your shop. Um, in the United States here, what we're doing is we're taking survey-based value segmentation and we are crosswalking it to the data we carry on demography and geography using predictive models. The, whether or not similar data are available in other countries just depends a lot on the country. And that is one of the real challenges of doing, especially audience focused research, but even the stuff that you guys are already doing that is cutting like people into boxes. If the next time you run that that audience survey of please click here and do a survey real quick you're collecting the demography of interest in your region, as well as a handful of questions that help you classify people by values, at least you'll be able to know oh. Our, if you say so, type people tend to be younger, which is true in every country in the United States, and our tough cookies people tend to be women or men or whatever, so that you can get a, a, a sense of where these different values are landing. Yeah, so thank you very much, Ricky. Uh, do you have any closing remarks uh, for our journalists? I, I want to make sure I just talked for a long time and told you all how to do your jobs. I, again, want to say, I don't know how to be a great journalist. I think this is one of the hardest jobs in the world. I am a pretty good data scientist, but honestly, these problems are really hard problems and I admire what you guys do every day. Yes, thank you very much, Ricky. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. And uh, I hope this webinar has helped you to uh, uh, better understand uh, the topic of uh, decoding audiences and creating engagement strategies. And uh, I hope uh, this webinar would also uh, inspire you uh, to better maximize the reach uh, of your stories and uh, make use of different tools and different channels and different strategies and also start thinking about issues that Ricky mentioned that you've not been thinking about before uh, your audience engagement and uh, if you are not a member of the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum yet uh, I would encourage you to please uh, find the group on Facebook and uh, for more information about the forum please go to www.icfj.org uh, if you would like to access journalism uh, resources on COVID-19 uh, please check out the International Journalist Network uh, at www.ignet.org and please don't forget to fill out a survey that is coming to your inbox after this webinar, because uh, ICFJ would love your feedback uh, in order for us to improve programming uh, for this series. Uh, I'm really glad uh, uh, about how Ricky uh, has been able to uh, expand our knowledge, uh, especially on these issues that we've discussed today. And uh, we hope uh, we'll be hearing from her and the other team members at Harmony Labs uh, in, in the nearest future uh, about the great work that they are doing. Uh, we'll also be joining, uh, having uh, a similarly engaging uh, uh, event uh, webinar next week. So please uh, endeavor to also register and be part of it. Uh, from everybody at the ICJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum, I'm saying uh, have a lovely day. And uh, we are out in five seconds. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. We're out. Uh, have a lovely day, bye.